I'm Erin Schoenberg. I'm with the Center for Rural Affairs and Skylar and Ben, who you can also see on the screen, hey guys, um, are from Buy Fresh, Buy Local and Nebraska Extension. And we have partnered to bring these trainings along with um, some other resources to rural farmers market managers and vendors across the state. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, as Aaron said, my name is Ben uh, McShane Jewell. I'm with the University of Nebraska Extension and I'm part of our regional food system initiative at Extension. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit tonight about marketing at farmers markets. And I hope this uh, is useful for you. So just to kind of get started, uh, thinking about why, why do we even care about marketing? Why is it important? So marketing really is about fulfilling needs that your customers have or perceive to have. So in order to do that, it's really important to understand what your potential customers want. Um, so kind of understanding customer behavior, uh, understanding who else is out there trying to fulfill those needs, thinking about what the competition might be in your market area. And then thinking of course about what options you have for delivering your products. So marketing really uh, is about connecting with people, building relationships and telling your stories. And ultimately, hopefully, right, marketing is about making sales and generating profit. So you've created something on your farm, in your kitchen, whatever it might be, that is very valuable, that fills a need that a customer has. And marketing provides the tools to kind of translate that perceived customer value into sales. Um, we know there's a strong consumer preference for wholesome, healthy foods for, their, for local families. We also know that when it comes to local foods, customers are looking for more than the product. They're really thinking about the story behind the product. Marketing is how you tell your story to potential customers to help you stand out uh, in a very crowded and competitive marketplace. It also helps customers connect with you. So, and to trust that your products are as good as you say they are, it helps you build long-term relationships with those customers so that they return to your market booth week after week to buy your products. Um, you could be doing lots of different things that are really valuable, but if customers don't know about it, then it's not gonna to translate to sales or them coming to your market. So when we think about what marketing is, there's a million definitions out there. If you do any kind of research online about defining marketing, you can get very overwhelmed quickly um, and it's difficult to identify what the useful parts of marketing are. So I'm just gonna to try to break it down quickly here into four different components to kind of hopefully provide a simple kind of overview of marketing for you all. So first, obviously you have to have a product to sell. So before you can market anything, you have to have something to market. So again, it's really important. It has to fulfill a customer need. If you're creating a product that no one wants, then it's not gonna go very far. Um, and also I would say too, if if everyone at your market is selling the exact same variety of tomatoes, for example, it's also gonna be very difficult to distinguish your products from others. So starting by having a product to sell, and then next, once you have your product, have to determine how you're going to get it, that product from your farm into the hands of potential customers. So in local food world, we often distinguish between two primary forms of marketing. There's your direct to consumer marketing, which you all do very well on a regular basis. That's your farmer's markets, your CSAs, anything where you, the producer, are exchanging that product directly with the end user. So distinguishing direct to consumer between with intermediated marketing, which would be any sort of sell, sales to uh, intermediator, intermediary, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, wholesale, et cetera, where the end user is a step removed. So you got a product, you got a place to sell it, and then thinking about price. So how much are you gonna charge for um, that product? And of course your business won't last very long if you're selling products for less than it costs you to produce them. So thinking about the cost of your production, really tracking closely what it costs you to produce each item that you, that you sell on market is really valuable. Um, we have resources that we can share with you after the, after the training that will help kind of identify some break-even analysis of your different products if anyone's interested in that. Um, it's also really helpful to have a sense of what others are charging for similar products. So it's not a bad idea to walk around markets if you're thinking about joining a new market to kind of 
take a tour around the market, see what people are charging for, for their products that are similar to yours and make note of those prices. Your customers are also a great source of information as well. Uh, you can talk to them at the market, sort of pay attention to their behavior and responses to different pricing options that you have. Um, you could also think about a simple email survey to get some anonymous feedback from customers as well. So you got a product, you got a place to sell it, you know what you're gonna charge for it. And then that, the last part of marketing is the promotion. So um, this is the part of the marketing that most people are familiar with. It's the way that you convey the value of your product to current and potential customers. So promotion includes everything from radio, newspaper, TV ads, social media, flyers, and signage. Um, whatever methods you choose, if your ma promotional materials are consistent in a way that pops out to customers and simplifies for them the answer to who you are and the value of your product, the more successful your promotions will be. So that kind of part of it where you're kind of consistently uh, putting everything out through different marketing channels is known as your brand. And so we're gonna talk about that here in just a little bit, talk about what, a br what components are uh, important to think about when developing a brand. But before we do that, we wanted to kind of show some examples and see if we can um, get some feedback from you all about what you recognize or what pops out to you from these different examples. So take a look at this first photo here. So this is uh, an image from a farmer's market booth. Uh, and just take a minute and think about what that display looks like to you. What stands out? What jumps out? Um, what comes to mind when you see this display? Uh, what do you know just automatically about this product or business just by looking at the display? And if anyone have some thoughts or ideas, you want to pop them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and tell everybody what you, what you see and what's standing out to you. We'll just start a little conversation. It seems like not the type of thing you'd see at a regular like Nebraska farmer's market booth. That's a really unique product. They yeah, even indicate on the okay. sign there that they're from Wisconsin. So you get a sense right away that this is not somebody in the immediate area. In the chat, folks are saying you see right away it's a maple syrup product. There's a cohesive marketing scheme. The signage is professional looking. Yeah, Those are all great cool. observations. Yeah, really great. Appreciate that. Yeah, the, the cohesiveness is one thing that really jumps out to me about, about this display. You got the colors and the, the font and everything is the same from the top banner to the bottom. You know, when I look at this, I just immediately transported to that Wisconsin woods where it's snowy and I'm cold and I want a pile of hot pancakes to put my maple syrup on. I just think it does a really nice job of conveying the product and something about the, uh, the business itself. You see that it's the Davis Family Sugar Shack, so it's got sort of a family component to it. And then on the banner too, very simply, and almost didn't even notice it, but sugarshack.com. So you know how to find them um, right there uh, on the sign. So just very consistent. Uh, it projects a really, a really clear image of the product and of the business themselves. So great, thank you for that feedback. Let's do another one. So this one is a little bit different. This is Grow With The Flow Aquaponics. Um, they, this is from the downtown Lincoln Farmer's Market. Same thing here, just take a look at this display. What stands out to you? What do you notice? What does it convey? What sort of ideas do you take away from this image? I noticed I right away how active they must be on social media. Or at least they were at one point when they made the sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got their uh, social media uh, taglines there. You can see the at GWTF Aquaponics. You see they're on Facebook, they're on Instagram. Yep. Absolutely. I see a chat there. I'm having a hard time. Getting Clean to it. and professional, Ben, is what that says in the chat. I'll try to keep reading those. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, clean and professional. Very clean. It looks very crisp. I like the, the, the look of everything. You can read all the signs from a distance. Great. Absolutely. That's always important. You got people walking through, you got walking by, big crowds. You want them to be able to, to understand what they're looking at right away. That lime green, or at least it comes across as lime, that's a really unique choice, I think, and it, it really helps things stand out and um, kind of bring that cohesion to it. Absolutely. Yeah, so one thing that it really stands out to me about this, this display, it's consistent. Again, like Aaron was saying, the green on the tablecloth there pretty closely matches the green on the signs. 
And that's a really simple addition to your table display to match uh, the kind of coloring that you've chosen for your fonts and stuff like that and logo. Um, I really like to, I think one of the other things that I wanted to just kind of emphasize here is that um, you can have the very professional graphically designed uh, wraps on your van and, and on, your, on your tent there, but you can also add handwritten signs. So I just love the handwritten chalk signs that go along with it. They still stay with the kind of consistent branding idea. There's similar kind of text looking there and it, it matches with the overall look. And I just think that adds a nice element of very, very highly professional with a kind of uh, hand, handmade DIY sort of feel to it as well. All right, one more. Let's take a look at one more here. This is a very different uh, look, but this is a, a cheese uh, producer uh, out of Iowa. So same thing. Let's just take a quick look here and uh, spend a minute and come up with some ideas of what really stands out. I noticed like the photos, I guess. Like I would kind of want to come up and ask like, what's in that photo? <laughs> yeah, so a nice touch. I, I, Thanks, Skylar. The, the photos are great. You can see uh, the picture of this, this guy and it looks like with his kids there. I know it's probably not real easy to see them from if you're looking at the slides, but you got this picture here of the guy with his kids and his cows. So it's a really nice kind of family image there that really pops out in some of the others. There's a chat that mentions the pattern on the tablecloth stands out. And I think that can be a good or bad thing. Someone else also adds that it's probably too busy and um, lose the products you want to display. Yeah, because of the, the pattern of the cloth is mm -hmm. kind of making it hard to see the, the products. Yeah, I would agree with that. So overall, a really nice display, but that tablecloth is a little bit busy. It's a little bit distracting, kind of takes away from the products themselves. But, um, you know, stuff on the table, I just, I like the sort of family nature of the photos. You can, one thing that we've talked about is uh, when you're selling a product, that's a little bit harder to show uh, the product sometimes. So for example, if you were a meat producer and you were selling meat, you might wanna have pictures of the cattle or the different animals or whatever they might be. So I like the images of the farm that he's added here. I also see, he looks like a friendly guy. He looks very friendly and welcoming. That's the kind of guy you wanna stop at a farmer's market booth and just talk to him and have a sample of that cheese. So really just wanna emphasize here, it doesn't have to be very elaborate displays. You can have some printed signs on a cork board, a sample of some cheese, a shirt that matches your branding, and a smile, and you're doing pretty good. Looks like we got one more chat. That's just me saying oh, that's this. <laughs> this guy makes me so happy every time we get to this slide. Like I smile in response to his smile, and it's just a picture. That really says so much. It does. It does. It's a really great, it's a great image. Okay. Let's move on. So just let's talk a little bit about brand and, and how to develop a brand. So your brand is really the customer's first impression of your market or farm. It's the public facing part of your overall marketing plan. Uh, it's how customers perceive your brand or how they perceive your brand can really increase awareness of your business, attract new customers and build trust and loyalty that leads to return customers. So from an eye catching logo to consistent colors, there are several elements that we're gonna kind of walk through here real quick to just kind of give you an overview of, of brands and, and what you should be thinking about. Uh, as you kind of start to go through this on your own, if you're interested in kind of developing a more robust brand for yourself, it might feel very vague at first, but uh, you'll start to get a little bit more specific as you identify what you, what you want customers to feel and perceive when they interact with your market. So, Hopefully here, oh yes, there we go. So the first kind of component of your brand is just thinking about the overall personality. So think of your brand as the kind of overall overarching personality of either your farmer's market or your farm business itself. So what's it, what sets you apart from other markets? What are your values, your mission? How do your products, programs, and events fit into the, the customer's life? Um, brainstorming some words and feelings that you would want customers or vendors or the general community to associate with your market is kind of a good starting place to thinking about the personality of your, of your farmer's market and then also as a component of your brand. Uh, relatedly, just thinking about what sort of voice you want to present when you're talking about your market, uh, uh, whether that be online or in person with customers who come through. How do you sound? How do you want to sound? Do you want to be down to earth, fun, silly, really polished? Um, identifying how you want to come across 
helps you kind of set some guidelines for the tone and words that you choose uh, for social media posts, whether you're in news interviews or in face-to-face -face, face -face interactions with the market. And then we talked a little bit about this with these example photos, but color is really important. Uh, it's easy to overlook, but colors are really powerful. They inspire feelings. They set the mood for the market itself. Uh, the colors you use in your branding will really affect the overall look and feel of the market. So it's, it's a good idea to take some time to research uh, colors and what sort of feelings they evoke for people. And then think about how you want to align those colors with the overall brand that you're trying to project. So for example, if, you're, if your market's in a park, you might want to think about some green tones to kind of match that outdoor park feel. Um, if your town is, uh, has a logo that uses blues, you might think about sort of matching a little bit some of that blue tone uh, in, your, in your logos to kind of uh, associate yourself with the town that you're in and their, their branding. Um, typeface, so we talked about this too. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, that one of the signs was really easy to read, which is just so important as you know. So choosing a one to two fonts to use on your signage and in your social media and other promotions and really stick with it. Be consistent with your typeface and, and uh, making it easy to read and sort of matching the overall look and feel that you're going for. And then the tagline. A tagline is just a really short description of the market um, that you can you can use in, in all your promotional materials. Um, if you can sum up your market in just a few words, that's a really great way to kind of communicate to people who you are, who you got, what your values are and what you're after. Uh, kind of brainstorming a list of ideas. You can talk to customers or vendors about what they think the market means and some, some phrases that they think about when they think about your market. Uh, and then use that tagline, develop it and use it in your social media use it on your website and really use it every time you do any sort of promotion for the market. And then the other thing that just going to hit one more time, just consistency. Staying on brand is really important. So the more you can be consistent with all these elements of your brand, uh, the more people start to recognize how your market looks and sounds. And you're really reinforcing through the brand all the, and all the visuals and words that you use, uh, sort of the overarching value of the market to the local community. Well, then lastly, I just want to mention that um, as you kind of go through this process, if you haven't already, if this is something you're thinking about exploring for next year, uh, thinking about what you're actually passionate about. So if you're a vendor coming to a farmer's market, uh, before you really kind of dive into, I'm going to be a direct to consumer farmer's market uh, producer, I'm going to go uh, intermediate in markets and go wholesale, really think about what you're passionate about before you start launching into it, because that obviously has a lot of impact on your production, but also the marketing approach that you take. So as we were talking about, if you're a people person and you really like that back and forth chatting with customers, that's one of the best marketing tools that you have. So being out there at the farmer's market, telling your own story week after week is really one of the best marketing approaches you can take. Uh, if that's less of your focus, less of your interest, thinking about a couple different ways uh, to get to some more kind of larger wholesale markets is a good way to go also. So just take some time, think about what you're really passionate about, and that should help drive what your marketing uh, efforts look like as well. So that's it for me. I'm going to pass it off to Skylar now. She's going to talk some more about uh, some short social media practices. If you're a vendor or a market manager, you know, like making... Um, kind of branding applies to both, you know, kind of like the colors you use on your social media page or, um, you know, if you're going to have uh, whenever you're, you know, the signs you make for your market, uh, if you're the market manager, just to keep, just to keep in mind that the, that, that is really relevant to both sides of this. Thanks for welcoming us into your living room or kitchen or wherever this evening. It's so great to have supporters of your market. It's like terrible to do it alone, whether you're a vendor or farmer's market manager. So really connecting with those other organizations can be a game changer. So anyway, first to introduce myself, my name is Skylar Falter. I am the Buy Fresh by Local Nebraska coordinator. We are located at the University of Nebraska. Um, you know, this is like from 2015, 16 maybe, um, of me at a farmer's market at a hospital. 
here in Lincoln. So I'm in Lincoln, but I've, um, I've played many roles in the food system from assistant market manager at a Lincoln, one of the larger producer markets in Lincoln. I'm obviously a local food advocate here for the food. I've been the farm hand, you know, the farm grunt work. Veg I currently own a business where I'm vegetable producer and I've like loved traveling the state and visiting farmers markets if it's not a pandemic. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately this year I haven't been to as many, um, but I've helped markets do surveys and uh, figure out ways they can partner with other organizations in their community to host events and to get more funding for what they really want to do, which is to get, you know, have a marketplace for healthy food in that community, which is like essential. And um, that's why we need marketing. So people know that all that value you bring to the community from your farm or as the market manager is really, really valuable. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just a little background for me. And we're going to talk a little bit about some some ways to boost sales and to I mean a really really sell sell yourself more I guess that that's kind of a negative term sometimes but um, Ben we can go to the next slide um, so you know one thing what what we're I guess I'm talking about promotion mainly and so what I'm looking for is how can we you know increase sales and attendance at your farmers market through like a two approaches the vendor acting individually the market manager acting individually, but also acting together, like as an ecosystem that if there's vendors that aren't, you know, super positive and promoting the market and doing, you know, thinking of it as a group activity to really get more people at the market, the market can be unsuccessful. And the same if it's just the market manager doing everything they possibly can, because they are one person, often both a vendor and a, and a manager in rural Nebraska. So um, I'm going to be talking about some takeaways from this uh, farmer's market in Delaware that did kind of like an exper experimenting on, you know, what makes people buy more, what makes more people shop at the market. Um, and it's called Farmer's Market Living Lab. And people can email if they need a copy of that. Um, document, but it's really, really insightful. So for vendors, what they really found is like, and some of these are kind of like, oh, duh, but some of them are like, so are really, um, they can change the way you think about your booth. Um, so people buy more of what they can see. And so that goes for um, if the color, you know, the color. So it's not only like what, what you bring, but how you display it. And so they can see more of what you brought in like a stacked fashion, tiered fashion, like it looks like it's very bountiful, kind of bringing in number one and number two together, um, people tend to buy that. And so if you have anything in a cooler at all, like you want your lettuce, you don't want your lettuce to get all wilty, so you have it in a cooler. What they found is that even putting a photo of the lettuce or of a beautiful salad with strawberries and um, pecans or something on that, um, cooler will help people want to buy it. And that also ties in number three, which is people buy more of what they know, know they can use. And so that again, if they see it already as a salad in an image, they'll think, oh, I have, you know, Pete and Jan are coming over on Tuesday, I can make this salad for them. Or um, if you're a meat vendor, this is where it's really applicable because meat vendors, you know, they might have that sidewalk chalk sign of what they have, but if you have a photo, um, of what's inside that cooler um, that can, or even of the pig, you know, what, what type of meat it is that is, they found that that can increase sales. Um, and at, through this experimentation, they were selling out an hour earlier if they had photos on the coolers. Um, so the last, and the last piece of kind of insightful information is that people want to know their farmer and will purchase more from farmers they like. And so that's really kind of that approachable aspect that like last farmer and Ben's example of like arms open, big smile. Um, that is, you know, that is something that people find can increase sales and make people want to want to learn more. And so if you have, you know, one thing this experiment also found is like even putting a name tag on, putting a name tag on you will help um, people know your name and that makes you more relatable and be able to remember like, oh, I bought from from Samantha last week at the market. And so that, that these are just some of the quick tidbits on, for vendors on what, what really helped increase sales for them. Um, the next slide is then just for takeaways for market managers. 
And so one of the big things is to, I know some of these are like, co, you know, COVID, it's, it's not super recommended to do special events and things like that. But there are ways, you know, to add maybe music in. So um, this is an example from downtown farmers market where they have music and they are able to, you know, that can be an event where you hear the music while you're walking through, but you're not actually like congregating. Um, and they found that special events resulted in 80 to 30% increase in vendor sales. Um, and so that's huge, that's participation and that's like community engagement in a way that is really vital to the long-term sustainability of markets. And one, you know, special events is also something that if, if you're a single market manager trying to do it all, it's tough. And so this is something like Buy Fresh by Local loves helping our member markets to try to do more events. Um, when Pre-COVID, we did local food showcases to try to highlight, you know, have samples out. That's another thing that people really like um, or will increase sales in having samples, which is definitely something not recommended right now. Um, a second thing that for takeaway from this Farmers Market Living Lab is you know, if you want, since time is so limited for market managers, you can do little games and raffles to understand which advertising outlet, if you are doing any paid advertisement, is the most productive. So let's say you do Facebook ads, you do newspaper, um, and maybe you have like just a sign up um, downtown at some coffee shops or something um, to advertise your market. You could do a raffle event where like each of those outlets has a different like code code word. And if you know that code word at the market, you get to put two, you know, two in instead of one. And then you can kind of keep track of, you know, how, which one is the most productive. I know that kind of, that's like really, that might be harder depending on your size of your market, but there's, that's something that by Fresh by Local could work with you if you're interested in doing something like that. Um, number three big takeaway is to really partner with other organizations. So you see here how the downtown market in Hastings, they have Health, Healthy Hastings, WYCA, and, you know, Hastings um, Art are all part of their um, sponsorships and they help, you know, promote these events. They help um, find musicians for the, for each market. So they really are pulling, you know, they're, they're doing work for your market because there's an aligned cause um, within those organizations and promotion. Um, so partnering with Chambers of Commerce, and like down, if there's any downtown, like Main Street, um, what would I call it? Oh, lost my train of thought. But downtown, they have some time, like market, like associations, I guess, you can join if you're part of a Main Street downtown business in some small, in some rural communities. Um, and then the last big takeaway is just like in day of market signage, like those big, you know, like A-frames on the floor, uh, on the ground, or like those like carnival, like flashing light things. Like sometimes Chamber of Commerce's um, or like other businesses already own those and they'll loan it to you or they will there can be funding if you partner with an organization to buy one of those signs so that um, you can um, I mean it usually so that you can promote your market better the day of so that's really people are driving down the street and they see that sign and they're more likely to stop and it also it's a little more tangible or I guess like concrete than Facebook right you send a Facebook post out um, like Friday or Thursday or, or the day of the market and it's really um, you know it goes out in the internet I guess it's not as tangible as like this is a sign there are 500 cars that go by this road during these two hours so this is what I'm going to you know maybe invest some time in some better signage um, and I guess about the partner I can't remember if I talked about it yeah we can go to the next slide I kind of get into you know how vendors and market managers can work together so the biggest is, you know, sharing social media posts. So if you, you know, find all the farmers, if you're a market manager, find all the farmers that are vendors for you. And if like you are time strapped and can't like make up brand new posts that are witty and funny every week, you can share their posts that they're talking about and promote them that way. And also, it also promotes your market. Um, and same with vendors. If the market says, hey, we're gonna be open this Saturday, you know, sh share that post on your page as well. So we're just trying to increase the collaborative value of our, of our promotion through social media. Um, the next way is for vendors to really get more involved with special events, which has been really successful at small markets. And so whether, you know, they know a local chef from in town or nearby town to do a cooking demo, 
Um, even if you have a hospital in your community, sometimes there's chefs at the hospitals. This is true in Hastings. Um, and we've done it in Lincoln where they are culinary artists and they are willing to do these demos because they support healthy, healthy eating. Um, music, art, so all these kind of special events. Of course, it, with COVID, you know, being tailored a little bit more, um, you could probably, I still think you could probably still have a market scavenger hunt um, for people to come out because it could, it could just be kind of individual and then they fill it out and they get it put in a raffle when they fill it out and the raffle would then be a giveaway basket from your vendors promoting their products. And that's something you could share on social media and get some excitement and energy um, through that way. So these are just some quick ideas. Each of these we could talk about in great detail if we had more time, but we'll just move on to kind of social media now, um, which I think, you know, based on some of our surveys, social media is kind of like the go-to place for promoting um, your market or as a vendor. And um, I'm going to talk about everything we can do to, you know, boost <laughs> engagement, I guess, with your posts. But social media is fast and easy, but it also, with Facebook, it, Facebook's free for people to use, but Facebook controls the audience. So they get to say who sees your posts or not through different algorithms. And so right now it's been quoted that, you know, only 10% of your Facebook followers will be shown your posts. And that's if you don't boost it. So if you've ever seen like on the post where it says boost, you know, boost your post, that's how you could pay more money to Facebook and they would show a wider audience your post and maybe not even, not just your followers, they would go outside of that realm as well. And so I know this kind of sounds like really sad news, but we have some ways to like work with this and why you still want to be engaged on social media. So we can go to the next um, post and Oh, I did, I did just update this slide right before, so maybe it didn't like fully update. So it, it should have three lines that I'll talk about it. So this doesn't mean Facebook isn't important. And so the reason is, is because people are going on your Facebook page, many different, not just because you posted something. Um, you know, if you search something, if you search on the internet, farmer's market, you know, Hastings or farmer's market, Scott's Bluff, you might eventually get to your, that someone might get to your Facebook page. And so if they get there, and even though your market's been going every week, but they don't see that you, you haven't posted in like three months, they might think that market's not open anymore. Or they might, you know, start to wonder what, you know, if it, what's going on at that market. And so posting regularly, whether that means once a week or even, or twice a week or once a month, at least shows that you're active um, on that channel and people like looking through your photos and browsing to see if they can see themselves going to that market. And so another kind of valuable thing is to make sure your about page is complete, that you, you fill out all the information you possibly can um, that they ask for. So that includes description, hours, contact info, tags, like you can write um, or like what type of business you are, that you're a farmer's market, that you're related to agriculture, a market, those are all, all those words um are, are part of are part of like what helps people get connected to your business on facebook and the last thing that i didn't get on this page because i was uh late was you know stick with what you already use if you don't you don't need to have all the platforms you don't need to get on instagram you don't need to get on facebook um if you don't if that's not like what you have time for so if you are on facebook i would just try to do that one really well you know try to post regularly get your about page up up going um, and not try to like just keep expanding because more social media platforms are coming on the market. And it's also perfectly okay to skip Facebook and go straight to Instagram. People people are do or you know people are doing that. I kind of say do what you enjoy doing in a sense. Um, so yeah we can move Heather, on to, oh, I yeah. to add real quick. I think with the pandemic it's actually it's even more important that um, you post pretty regularly because so many people aren't sure if you're open or not. This is for a market, a private business, anything. Um, and the easiest way to know if it's still mm -hmm. an ongoing thing is if you had a recent post, because you can't always trust the about and the bio and the website. But if you posted like three days ago, you're like, yes. oh, well, they're definitely, you know, open. So just to um, emphasize that. That is so true with COVID, it's even more important. And so if you kind of like a dusty Facebook, like you can get it back going just posting once or twice a week for the rest of the season. 
um, and and I think to have some some good impact. So these are kind of we talked about like Facebook is limiting who sees your post. So but these are some ways to kind of get better performance or engagement on your post. So you know using photos as often as you can. Facebook already obviously you can just type and not have any image. Um, and I say quality in the sense that it doesn't have to be like, you can use your iPhone, you could use a smartphone. It could be a little blurry, but you definitely like want it. It doesn't have to be professional, I guess is what I mean when I say quality. Um, another really great option that like market managers and vendors do is posting videos that they take with their phone the day of market. So people can see, you know, what they have at the market and kind of, you know, some people just like, they verbalize, like talk, oh, I have tomatoes and garlic and um, cucumbers, but sometimes they're like, it's I, not even any audio. It's just like a, just so they see it. So many people are selling things that way. Like um, <laughs> we had someone in the last class that did quilts. And so every market she posts what quilts she has. And most of the time, those are the ones that sell at the market. Someone will come and say, I saw this quilt on Facebook and I'd like to buy it. And so that, I think that would work well with vegetables and meat and also, you know, jewelry and crafts too. Um, we already touched on cross, cross share content. Um, you know, if you haven't used the at sign and tag, tag people, if your market, when I did say like share posts, that's one way to like stay connected. The other way is to really make sure that when you're, if you're going to type a vendor's name in, you can add, you know, the Hoagland Homestead and find Amy, who's, who's on the call here in Hastings, you know, as part of your promotion for your market. Um, you know, if you're a vendor, I think, I feel like post four to seven days a week, that might be a lot for a market. I realize like vendor, there are a lot of vendors, I think that are farmers that are like, that's a goal, but four, four seems like a lot. But <laughs> now that I read my own bullet point, it seems like a lot. Um, so boosting posts are, is again, we kind of talked about as a way to do paid ads for your market. The minimum day that face or Facebook will only boost if you do like days at a time and they, $10 is usually the minimum. But if you're in a rural community, $10 can go a really big, can go a really long way. And so I do recommend boosting posts. If you have like, let's say opening day, you have a vendor that's going to be there that isn't there all season, like the maple syrup or corn, you know, sweet corn just came in. Um, these kind of more things that people are curious about or might, you know, are kind of a little bit like a special event. Um, or if you're, you have an event coming up, you can boost that. And even now, like with COVID, people are making, I mean, it's like they're making an event on Facebook, but really it's just the sweet corn guy is there for three weeks. And so they're making that an event because letting people know that this is something that's not there all the time and people tend to really like, you know, pe when peaches come in or sweet corn, um, these kind of, they can be classified as events on Facebook and help that helps, you know, have, get more, spread more, spread more of your, what you have going on at your market. Um, so yeah, I kind of talked about the last two. So I think um, we can go on. I just have a quick example of like, how to have a fun Facebook post. Um, this is from Omaha Village Point Farmers Market that has this photo of an okra and it goes, what am I, what this is? And I just really like it because they're, they're asking people to engage with the post by you know writing, what's your favorite thing to prepare it? And they have a, like a, I guess I don't want to call it a bribe, but like they have a raffle or something that you get if you, if you participate, you could win $10 in farmer bucks. You don't even have to do like, you get anything just like these kind of fun and engaging posts are and, and again you can steal this right now you could like go to your market and take a photo of like a weird squash or something and, and ask the same thing and get people excited um, or even just a different looking tomato to get people aware that you know what's available at your market um, I love seeing that there are 33 comments on this, <laughs> even though there's actually only five likes and that probably like increased after you like took this screenshot or whatnot. But um, this is the type of question that's like so simple. You can't like not want to reply to it. Yeah. You know, whether you know it or not, you're like, this is so silly. I'm going to do it. And then every time you do that, someone else sees it pretty much. So it's just really neat to see how the comments totally outweigh the likes and that's yes. just as good, you know, or better. Yes, don't get, that's a great point, Erin. Don't get, don't get depressed about the likes. 
and <laughs> um, if, if the commenting is the best or people, if you even ask people to add a friend that likes this vegetable or, you know, I don't know, some creative way to get people to comment on your post or share your post um, is, a, is a great way <laughs> to do that. So we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to get that teaser in. So um, just a reminder that marketing like occurs before, at, and after the market. And so this is kind of tying together some of the things we went over, but you know, before the market, really having any, some sort of online presence so that customers know, know you before they shop is helpful. Um, because again, we found out from earlier that with that, that experiment at the market in Delaware, people buy from people they like and know. So if you can get that sense that they kind of know you before they see you or, or they, um, when they see you are on the Buy Fresh Buy Local site, they're like, oh yeah, I already visited that, that market and now I know their name because the name is written on the website. So either you have your own website or you're listed on the Buy Fresh Buy Local online food guide um, or other sites like Local Harvest, um, having a Facebook is, a, is another way. Um, and so that, that's a pre-market activity. Another one is, you know, to engage with these, with customers through e-newsletter. And um, finally, is like, you can use this to show, the pre-marketing is kind of show how, what you're selling can help them solve a problem. So really in the realm of local food, you know, you can, you can brainstorm what that is, but like at the heart, or, you know, what that is for you. But at the heart, it's, you know, you're helping fit, families or people in your community find access to locally grown healthy foods is an example of what what you're doing to help people and so and to serve people in your community so that's kind of what the pre-marketing can be about and then we can go to the next one during the market um, it's all about people it's all about being approachable and patient and you know conversational and so kind of what these like low cost ways to increase repeat customers is just ways uh, for, for you to have like just real life authentic conversations with people at market. And so this is, you know, these ways are smile, be friendly, even wear a name tag, yeah. um, put photos outside the coolers, you know, be, put signs up about your farm. So this is, this is a market stand that sells chilies. Obviously it's very well branded and like, uh, creative and you know you're gonna remember the chili woman and so <laughs> um the next time you shop at that market um so yeah i think i added put on soap sorry i have like a lot of computers here and i can't really see my slides there we go um so as you see the on the right hand side you can see that's so even putting up a simple sign about your farm um you don't even have to you wouldn't have to print it in color i would definitely recommend laminating it if you're at the farm but to say who you are, where you're located, you know, even like a, it's kind of like a maybe what you would say if you were speed dating or something, like what, what would you tell them about yourself if you had 30 seconds and you could write it on that piece of paper. Um, and I think the last thing I just want to say about during market is that one thing like I, like we talked about, people use things that they know how to use, right? So if you have some, if you're growing some things that aren't familiar to people, uh, really have like the, the Living Lab experiment found that like having a recipe card is really great there. Um, if you're mostly because then you can use that recipe card as a talking point for people. It's not enough just like set the recipe card out and not talk about it and not bring it up or anything. What they found is like, if you see someone looking at something or even at your booth, you could say, hey, have you ever seen this vegetable before? It's called kohlrabi. I have this recipe here that, you know, however you got that recipe, whether, I mean, be real, you wouldn't say I just Googled it and I cooked it and it was amazing. Or you'd say it's your great grandmother's recipe and, you know, start out conversation that way. Those are really great ways to increase repeat customers and sales for your for your event as a, as a vendor. Um, and even if you're, I wanted to relate it to market managers a little bit too. So if you, if you are the market manager and you also are a vendor, even having a sign about the market at your booth, if like that says when you're open, um, you know, even how long you guys have existed, like anything that adds that layering of telling your story, like this market's been open for 40 years or 10 years or five years, just to get that information out there. And if you are just a market manager and you do have a booth, you know, putting that information out there just again adds to, adds to your story and the charm 
of the market. So, um, you know, the last thing is just like posting on social media live if you're at the market or a post at the market um, on, on what's available that day. So people, people know before coming what they might expect. And so, whew, yeah, I talk fast. I've talked fast, everyone. So uh, the last thing is like, how do you keep this all organized if you're going to try to post four times a week for either the market or if you're the market manager or a vendor? Again, posting four times a week doesn't mean you have to create original content. It can mean sharing a post or sharing about another event in the community that's not even necessarily related to the market, but that you think your customers that shop at the market might be interested in. Um, so this is an example of a marketing calendar and you can search, you know, if you look online, there's tons of examples of marketing calendars. This is the Buy Fresh by Local marketing calendar where you can see we have every week laid out and then we put, we feature members, we feature three members of the week each week and then we also have like two posts for content. And so we kind of just like fill this in. Um, it looks like we didn't get to it till March. Sometimes we try to do it earlier. Um, and fill in, you know, what a general idea of what we want. And this is just a spreadsheet. And then we really just keep with it. Sunday night, we always check it. And we, and then we, po we post about these uh, vendors throughout the week. So that's another kind of thing to have in you, your toolkit if you, if you want some help organizing it. Or if you even have someone else that's interested in, in helping with the promotion that helps keep, keep everyone on the same page. I'm curious, maybe we'll talk about this in the break if anyone else has experience or Skylar, if you do, but do you ever, do you schedule these at all? Or do you just kind of have a plan for when to do it? I know, I know a few farmers I've heard of do that. Yeah, we, we don't schedule things very often. I'm not sure what, yeah, I think it's just our personalities. Like it just seems really hard to like get in the zone like and, and do it. Like if, if it's not like right then, but I do know like scheduling is a very popular thing with even with social media and like e-newsletters. Like you could write your content it, during the off season and then have it all ready and scheduled for the season. Um, so scheduling posts is another, you know, social media face, I guess Facebook allows that without an additional app to, to do if you're busy and you're like, I can't do it the day of. You could schedule it the night before market to say what you're going to have. And I think what helps with this like marketing calendar is, uh, is like just trying to take photos a lot throughout the week. So like you don't have to take the photo right then when you make the post. Um, I find that is like better when I had, when I was the assistant market manager, just from every week at market, I would take, I'm like, I have got to take at least six photos so that I have them in my pocket for the newsletter or for social media for the rest of the year. Um, and then I actually like would save them on the computer because then they get lost in your phone and you, it's hard to find. So um, yeah, well, I think we'll move on because I think I'm running a little bit long on my time. Um, the last is just thinking about metrics for marketing. So if you, you know, really measuring, we are all, I'm sorry, we're all strapped for time as vendors and as market managers. So sometimes it is, it can be really helpful to measure where you are now. What it, how many customers do you have coming to your market now and writing that down. And this could be, attendance could be, you don't have to take it every, you don't have to, it's not counting every single person. There are ways where you just count it for 10 minutes every hour and you use that data to then determine how many, you know, an estimate, because essentially it's about doing it the same every time. So you're counting consistently, but some of these measures either from the vendors or market managers can really help you understand if your marketing is actually boosting sales, because we all have our own bias of like, oh, that market was terrible or it was sweltering hot. Um, but if we're not keeping track of sales and then we are, then it's going to be harder to really measure that impact. And my last thing is just the last slide as a second to last slide is just, you know, really think about like, what's that one thing you want to try this year, even this year, like, do you want to try to make a fancier sign because uh, to engage customers, do you want to think about even next year, a frequent shopper card for your market name tag, um, you know, adding signs to your market booth, a lot about signs, sorry, sorry there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think just, I guess, thinking about that. So the, the next thing is if you are a market manager, join our Facebook group. We're trying to have that be kind of a space where active market managers in the state of Nebraska can come to talk about their challenges and what, what 
what people are doing amid COVID to try to get more uh, vendors or customers to their market. It's been a really great way. Like someone's like, I need a, a melon vendor, you know, and they'll send it out to the Facebook group. And so people will reply with suggestions. So it's been a really great location for all of that. Um, the last is just sharing that anyone can join our network that's a vendor or farmer's market. We promote local foods to customers that are interested in finding healthy access and locally grown Nebraska products. So we have a printed food guide. We make posters for our farmer's market members. As you see on the right hand side, you can go to our website at Buy Local Nebraska to learn more. And now I think we're open for questions. Um, I wanted to mention, I, I forgot about this when we talked about this last week, but the tagline, Ben, this was in your piece of it. I remember going to a marketing meeting. Um, I, was, I was at a company, we had paid someone to give us like some marketing advice. And specifically on the tagline, what I took away from it is that it doesn't need to be so literal. People really try to break it down of like, we sell melons. You know, but really, if you have something more catchy that's not so literal, it goes further. And you can think about this from like any, you know, name brand candy bar or sports brand, whatever it is, it doesn't have to say what you do. It right. just has to be something people re remember. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it conveys part of, uh, yeah, the image of who the company is, right? I'm just going to pop in the chat our go to grow like rural farmers market promotion campaign that this group here that everyone that is presenting or will present is a part of this campaign to really boost um, the awareness of rural farmers markets in the state because they are some of the greatest places to visit. They're what we buy fresh by local call, calls hashtag Nebraska treasures, um, you know, of what you can find. So that page, that URL is just a page to kind of promote and find farmers markets across the state. Okay. Well, um, I will be speaking for the second part of this evening and we're gonna be focusing on vendor recruitment and vendor retention. And I loved how Skylar gave a little bit more in depth background. So I wanted to do that as well. I'm Erin Schoenberg and I'm with the Center for Rural Affairs and I have a lot of experience that's really varied in local food. I have been a producer. I've been a farmhand. I have run um, like a local food trucking company and been an owner and sales manager of a local food um, distribution company too. So I have a lot of varied experience. And so I, I do think that probably helps people get more of that um, understand our background. And, and so if that helps, as well with follow-up for people, you know, knowing a little bit more about us might help you, you know, think of additional detailed follow-up questions. And we're just always open to that. We want to, you know, help you in whatever ways we can. And we know that this group on the call, you know, is diverse and not everyone, you know, can, can be here at the same time. So whatever we can do in the following, you know, months and, and years, to be honest, um, please don't, don't be shy. So when we're talking about vendor recruitment and vendor retention, I definitely want to point out that although we're focusing on a lot of strategies for managers, the vendors on the call as well really need to think of every strategy and then turn it around and think about it as something to consider as a vendor. Um, because ultimately, the vendor recruitment piece is just marketing continued. The market is marketing itself to vendors and vendors as well need to think about what they have to offer the market. You know, you have to think about what do you have to offer the market? What does the market have to offer you? So in the spring, when we were able to call managers, we asked them various questions and we heard back on the issue of vendor recruitment. So there's a lot of word of mouth that takes place, which is great to hear in a lot of social media. And we need to keep in mind that you always need to keep pushing in both right? Um, you need to keep up with modern ways of recruitment, you know, as well as marketing, but don't forget about word of mouth. Don't forget about signage. Don't forget about the more traditional ways of reaching out as well, because we have found that it's a, it's a diverse crowd out there. You're, you're working with diverse populations with, you know, ages and generations that, that span 
decades. And so you really need to think about um, all, all strategies. You need to keep in mind that teams get more done than single people, especially when we're dealing with small or non-existent budgets. And a lot of managers are volunteers or paid just, you know, maybe a small stipend or only have a couple hours, you know, a week outside of market to, um, or if, you know, if that, to put into this. We have heard that when vendors know the rules and the rules are enforced, they know what to expect, you have better retention. You end up having happier vendors. There is still though an ever present need to keep attracting vendors. And it doesn't always mean that if you have turnover, you're doing something wrong. You know, sometimes vendors move on for various reasons. So you can't get down on it as a manager. You really need to focus on what you're doing right and just keep on it every year. So we are, of course, trying to address rural farmers markets in general. And so one challenge that comes to mind is that in rural areas, you know, by default, there are fewer people. That's what makes them rural. And so the vendors are going to be, um, you know, they're gonna be few and far between. And so that's something too that you can't get down about. You need to think about strategies to work with other with other managers, you know, other communities on making sure that you can, you know, even share in a way vendors so the vendors can have the best bet to reach their customers and both markets can be successful as well. You know, on the same page there, there aren't as many customers. You really need to make sure that you have a strong customer base, um, folks that are really out there to buy their groceries. And then rural residents do garden. I think this is, you know, pretty commonly seen across the state and in, in many states. And so, of course, produce is not the only thing sold at farmers markets, but, but it, it is generally, you know, one of the backbone pieces. And so you need to think about how can you find that niche? What can you grow that people aren't growing? What are some of the high value items that are a pain in the butt to grow? Maybe focus on them. So just some challenges to think about here. And then as said, it can be tough when the managing body is spread thin. But we also need to remember there are a lot of opportunities that are unique to rural places. And one of those is that communities are often really tight knit. There's often a lot of small town pride around supporting each other, supporting locally owned businesses. Um, I, I know of many examples of this, just, you know, anecdotally, I grew up just outside of Bassett, and I know they have a, like a chamber, I think, sponsored program around the holidays where a lot of businesses um, kind of join this program, and there's a, you know, Bassett Bucks, I think is what they call it, to really emphasize and incentivize people to support local even more. So there is a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity there, and we know that you know, hand-grown, handmade quality items and workmanship are also valued in small towns. And because you're not going to be inundated in the small town with dozens of events, you know, every day of the week year round, each social event has a lot more of a chance to really stand out. You know, I, um, like I said, I live outside of Lincoln and even during COVID, there's tons of stuff going on. It gets flooded in a way. So even if I value local food and I really you know, wanna make a point to go to the markets, I know there's another one coming, you know, there's gonna be three or four probably. And then, you know, I also have this thing going on and I can stop here and there. But in a small town when there, when there are fewer opportunities um, to get out and be social in that way, you wanna really just leverage that to your advantage. So farmers markets are major team efforts I think of the four like team players here as the community, the buying customers, the managing body, and then your great vendors. And the community could be the municipality that allows you to set up, you know, on Main Street and maybe uh, route traffic a different way. I like to emphasize the buying part of customers because even though you do need a crowd to come out and not every single person, you know, needs to spend a certain dollar amount, you need enough people there really getting their wallets out to make it worth it for everyone. Of course, the manager and then the, the vendors that are diverse enough to make sure you have enough products to make it attractive to customers. 
and reliable that they're showing up every week and being consistent. Um, this is a picture from Fallbrook. And I think this is just you know, an example of what you can see as, as a successful team effort. So we will talk about five steps for managers, but again, things to consider as vendors to be successful with bringing vendors in. We will talk about targeting, analyzing, making that plan and strategy, um, which is the act step, reaching out and actually bringing vendors on, and then how to integrate them to keep them happy, keep your market moving together as a team. So the target step is taking a step back and thinking, who am I going to reach out to? Am I just going to throw things at the wall and see what sticks? I think that's what a lot of us end up doing. But if we have a more strategic plan in place and we really know who we're trying to reach, that's gonna help us get focused and, and get a plan out that will be more effective. So bef you know, before you know who you want to recruit, you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. And that could be various things for various markets. There's not a right answer to this. It might be that you want your customers to be able to come to market and buy 70% of their groceries for the week. But at another market, you might want to have people come and buy organic you know, produce and grass-fed meat. Maybe you're you know, going for that angle of that type of production practice or you might want a very well-rounded market that has, you know, for example, some beadwork. So one more step back is what will, what will customers buy? And Ben spoke you know, about this in the marketing piece is that you can have the product, but do you have the people who will actually purchase it? So there are of course ways to find that out. And I think the, um, the DOT survey is one great example of doing that. Um, and I'll show one example of that. Here's a picture of me at the farmer's market. And I wanted to bring this up because I think especially now um, when in the pandemic we're social distancing, we're not getting too close to people. We can't really see people's face and interact with them in the same way. I know I, I'm someone who loves talking to people and I'm not doing that now. I'm really keeping to myself. Like when I see people at the grocery store, I'm kind of like head down keep moving. You know, same at the market. I just want to get my business done and get out of there. So I think it, it just is another like way to see we can't judge without actually getting feedback from people. And so this is an example from the USDA's um, website. It's from years ago, but these things don't really need to be, you know, updated that, that much. So here are two things that they pulled customers on. And you could even do this, I think, during the pandemic. There's really not a lot of you know, closeness or interaction you would need. They just need to be able to pick up a sticker and then on their own, go put it there. So you first want to know, what do we have at the market? You know, sit down, make a list. You know, how many produce growers do we have? Do we have home bakers? Do we have jewelry? Do we have meat? Think about all the things that you offer and maybe what's missing. Maybe it will already jump out at you, you know, without having to um, seek out what's missing from others, but you'll get a good idea of what people are buying and then how often they come fits right into that. Because if you had all the, you know, fresh fruit and veggie people, you know, only coming every, you know, once a month, then it doesn't hold as much weight as it would if they come regularly. So just a couple ideas of trying to find out what will people buy, so you know who to who to reach out to. There are some other tips in finding groups that maybe have not been reached out to in the past. So we've got a picture of an FFA chapter here. You know, 4-H would be another great club to see if they are interested in having a booth. Other, other clubs and guilds, I'll bring up that quilt example that Skylar did as well. You know, it depends on if you decide you want crafts or not, and that might be based on will people spend money on crafts, not just your own, you know, opinion of do we want them or not. It needs to be a, a greater, a greater ask than that. And then um, a lot of farmers markets find that reaching out to immigrant and refugee communities is a way to really just add to the like, you know, inclusion of the market and really bring some great diversity that you don't know what awesome vendors are out there if you don't, you know, make 
make a welcoming environment and seek out help, you know, when needed also to bring um, communities in. You know, if you need help with language, if you need help on how do I reach, you know, new populations, that's something that you can reach out to us and we can try to help with too. And finding community partners is a good idea with that as well. Um, you don't want to be super responsive and just add a whole category, you know, of vendors if it might just be a short-term solution. I want to I want to get a different example than the donut hole I, I used last time because I think I really overdid that. But maybe um, some kind of sweet fake to good. You know, maybe we see because of some type of trend or social media that there is a certain sweet treat that's really, you know, popular one year. Should you, you know, reach out and bring in, you know, several vendors who have sweet things to the market? Well, you need to look at it as more than just a short-term solution. You need to think, what are people coming to the market for? Do they want this to be a healthy market? Do they, are there already bakeries in town that might suffer because I'm bringing, you know, outside vendor in to do this? You know, will this stick around? So think about those things. There's not a right or wrong or, or you know, quick answer to it, but, but getting some goals down will really um, help you. So the analyze piece is, you know, think of those groups, think of those individual vendors that you want to bring in and what's stopping you and what's stopping them from knowing about you. And we touched on this a little bit with, you know, perhaps language or culture and needing to break down some barriers there. Um, but as well, the one I want to focus on um, for this slide is the production or the scale. So it's, it's probably easiest to think about this really as the, the food producers, not so much the crafters and like prepared food, but more of the, let's say, produce, dairy, and meat. If you have a lot of people who have gardened, you know, as more of a hobby, they might be really good at growing, you know, one or two types of tomatoes for a limited season. And it's great and they sell out and, you know, all is well and good. But again, as mentioned in the marketing piece, the more you have, the more you sell. There is, there's that stack it high, watch it fly, you know, um, like model that is, that is mentioned at farmer's markets and it's totally true. So what can you consider doing to help vendors scale up their production? Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be the expert, but maybe there is a local extension agent who could teach a class. Maybe there is a horticulture, you know, instructor at the high school or college that you could bring in. Um, I guess that would be, you know, along the produce line um, example. But what can you do to try to help help everyone kind of grow together and 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 up their up their production scale? These other, you know, barriers could be. If you don't have very clear rules and, and regulations, maybe they're extra complicated or they're so simple that people just don't really know, do you just come and set up and anything goes, you know, that that's going to work against you. So being able to have, you know, clear rules and regs, offer some opportunities for workshops, think of, think of the lack of vendors, not as an actual lack, but that you haven't, you haven't reached out to the ones who were there yet. You know, and so the the timing piece would be if you're offering the market at an unideal time for vendors, like if you have some folks who are driving in maybe from area towns, you want to think about start and end times, make it convenient for vendors, obviously, as well as customers and make sure you're not competing with other area markets that could collaborate with you on on avoiding overlap of times and days of the week. Um, then the vendors will be able to sell at both markets if you can if you can work with your friends in the next town. So after we have thought about, you know, who can we bring in and why? What will people buy? What is stopping us from reaching them? What's stopping them from finding us? We want to get a plan together. Um, this is like a coworker of mine, Anna. She is, I'm pretending that she is reading a handout that she prepared to market your market. And so what you want to do for this piece, and this would be a great exercise, and we can provide some examples of these like the resources that we send out, but you want to think about what are we doing right? You know, what's great about our market? 
and really be open as you think about this. Maybe you have four vendors, but last year you only had three. Great. You can say you're actively, you know, seeking new vendors every year. Like just kind of use the facts to present a case for yourself. Maybe it's your location that there is this grove of, you know, oak or cottonwood trees in town and really and really push that as how great your market is. Maybe you're a great manager with, you know, communication skills that are just above and beyond. Use that. Um, you can just put together kind of a, a half page, you know, sheet to hand out, hand it to all your vendors, have them spread the word as well. Since in the act, you know, piece of this, we're really just kind of putting that strategy together. You want to think about what types of workshops could I offer vendors? Um, again, that you might bring a partner in for. You don't have to do it all. And then talk to those neighboring markets and, and, and be open to all feedback that you get from vendors and from co customers, whether it's those dot surveys or whether it's, you know, having an end of season, you know, potluck and vendor meeting. Think about um, the rules that you have, what works and what doesn't for you. And just be open to make changes. But keep in mind that it takes a while you know, for change to happen and don't, don't get frustrated with it. Just get the right people, you know, um, working with you. And here's, right, a group of people who are, you know, um, teaming up to work on something together. We'll, uh, I'll show you an example of an exercise that will help um, get your calendar kind of filled out, get your timeline in place for, you know, you only have a limited amount of time to really get vendors for the next season. And that starts, you know, kind of at the end of the most previous season. So it's about that time that you can think about how your season went, what you want to do to improve it, get that group effort going, um, you know, get the vendors involved, get, you know, community advocates and champions involved. Think about that elevator speech. This goes back to how this is just tied so closely to marketing. You know, um, tell me about your business, your market in 30 seconds or 60 seconds, or you could think about it in a bullet point, you know, fashion. What are, what are the six best things about, you know, your market or your business? And so um, just put all that that you have learned into a plan these two other pieces that can be really handy would be a vendor packet and an orientation packet, which could be one and the same, but you want to be able to follow up with vendors once you get that conversation started. So if you put together your handy little, um, you know, half pager that says we've got a great location, the market manager is very organized and is a wonderful communicator and we're under, you know, the cottonwoods. Um, and then the vendor says, that sounds great. I, I think I'm interested. Do you have an application I could see? You want to make sure you're ready to keep that conversation going, not, oh, yeah, we, uh, we're putting the packets together in, you know, in January. Um, obviously, you, you, know, you can't have everything just ready, you know, uh, knee-jerk response type of thing, but get all of your materials organized, ready. If you can share them online, that's a bonus. If you can, you know, print applications, print the rules and regs, keep copies with you. So you're ready to be really attractive to vendors. Um, that'll be helpful. So this was put together, as you can see from the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. I wanted to actually um, put in front of you like an exercise that could be done um, you know on your own you could you could actually print out multiple copies of these if you have a board or if you have you know volunteers even um, yeah other vendors would be great to include on this um, so think about what type of strategy you want to fill in and if this was easier to just do an example here I wish we would have um, I could make this more able to be filled out but you can just put in there you know, um, that you want to reach out to Extension, you know, and it's going to be an initial, you know, um, contact because you want to see if they can, you know, host like a vendor meeting, you know, in early spring to talk about production. So you can see here that you're, you know, targeting Extension and you're targeting vendors. 
And then you can kind of see how this all goes. You're maybe hoping, this could be your projection that ends up getting changed a little bit. You think extension won't charge for this. So you can put that there. You might want to think about it's going to take two or three hours you know, of your time. And so think about cost to not just in dollars, but in time. It is, it can be, you know, one and the same, really. Um, as if you're the manager, will you be responsible or do you have someone else who you're hoping to have handle this? So this is one way to really get everything written down. If you don't have that, that calendar, you know, like Skylar shared that really great example of the spreadsheet, you know, with the, with the Facebook posts, it's the same thing with vendor recruitment. You want to think about what you're going to do when, and if you have it written down, it is so much more likely to actually, you know, get, get done. And you can delegate so much easier if it's written down. Um, if it's not, you are a little bit more on your own and that's, that's not ideal. So for the integrate piece, this is after you have been able to bring vendors on. And even if you're dealing with the same core vendors you've had for a few years and there's not someone new, but you haven't started that type of tradition yet that brings people together, I just highly encourage you to try to work that into your annual cycle. Um, I know markets that do a couple potlucks, kind of end of season and then beginning of season. That can be nice, um, especially because it's so hard for schedules to work to work out. Um, people can have a couple different options to join. Um, of course, you know, we know that Zoom is another way or other video conference, you know, services to at least have, have some opportunities, some options for people to join. Um, you want to also think about balancing the, you know, the shop talk, the work time, the real like nuts and bolts of making the market and the season and the farms and the businesses grow, but also just socializing on a more personal level for relationship, you know, growth and strength. It's really important to have some of both, even if they are also, you know, integrated, you want to be able to, you know, have people feel like they can bring their family and you can learn a little bit more about them. We've heard from managers that that weekly maintenance of the relationship is so important. I um, have definitely seen that, you know, in all of my, you know, in all my ag experience, just that weekly check-in, how you doing? Great to see you. You know, if you're talking to vendors, you know, notice if they've got something new that week or, you know, anything like that is, is just so nice. It makes people feel like their voice really matters and that it is that team effort. So I won't go through these, but I'll just leave this slide up for a minute so you can think about, and this goes back to that, that exercise, you know, that handout, that chart. These are some of those strategies you can put in that first column to say, okay, and add the local newspaper. So I'll go back to that one, right? So add the local newspaper goes in that first column. And then you think about, okay, why am I doing that? And here's a rough draft, you know, of what I'm going to do. Who are you targeting? Are you thinking about bringing in customers or are you thinking about recruiting those vendors? So that would be a way to take some of these strategies and really get them into that plan. And you could go on and on about different ideas here, right? Like I'm sure, um, you know, reading this, um, the audience tonight might think, oh, I've already done all that. Or, oh, what about this? What about that? Or I didn't think of this one. It really can go on and on and they might not all work in every circumstance. So it's good to take in all the ideas, kind of um, check them against your goals and against what you know customers will buy if you've been able to gather some of that and kind of pare this down to what is a doable you know, plan for you. We know a lot of markets out there and, you know, and businesses out there who vend are pretty small scale and there aren't, there aren't you know, solutions that always fit um, every area. So just some examples there, and we'll share the, these if, you know, if anyone wants to read that in more depth later. And then hopefully this does help, you know, on the flip side for vendors. If, if you're able to just, you know, listen to these strategies that, that managers need to take into account, what does that give you, you know, to think about and to look for? you, I think, will be more apt to pick out, you know, markets and communities that you can tell are supportive, that you can tell really, you know, have a plan for success. 
and you know what to look for a little bit more. And you also want to be thinking about, you know, what you have to offer the market, you know, going back to that production, you know, example from earlier, if this made you think, oh man, I do always sell out of, you know, this particular item each week. I don't know, you know, even how to make more or, you know, what can I do to make this more sustainable year round? Um, those are some, some ideas that might help you seek out those resources, you know, in the off season or see if the market or the community you're in could, could help you, um, you know, bring those, bring those resources in. And hopefully also as a vendor, you see how important that team effort is and that if each vendor can help the manager, you know, market the market um, and, and bring in other great vendors, um, that, that'll go a long way for you. So we will move on um, pretty quickly through retention. This really kind of falls back on the last step of recruitment and how once you get great vendors, how can you keep them? So we'll go through some slides there and then looks like we're on track to have some time at the end to do some Q&A there. And if anyone wants to, you know, share experiences or questions, that's always great. So to keep those vendors coming back and coming happy, we've broken that down again into these five different steps. Cultivate a community, govern together, manage your finances transparently and effectively, promote each other, and nurture and grow. Again, I just really had Anna be like my model for these slides. So she's like looking at some farmer's market vendors in this picture because it's the pandemic and she can't see them in person. So um, thank you, Anna. Um, I, I want to talk about the cultivate piece because we do really get focused, I think, on customers and you know, me too, right? I'm focused on what will that customer buy, but we can't forget about the culture and the community of vendors as well and making it something that people look forward to, you know, each week. And so this might just be more of, of an environment thing that it's not, it's just being cognizant of that. It's being mindful that you want to create this, you know, it doesn't have to be family necessarily, but that welcoming, friendly, you know, organized place that each week vendors are, are looking forward to come to. And so a little bit really goes a lot there, I think. Govern Together is a, is a huge one. And um, we heard, yeah, from lots of managers that if, if vendors feel like they're being ignored or their concerns aren't being addressed, then they're, they're, they're not going to, you know, stick around for too long. Um, it is a fine line, of course, because, you know, we, we need to keep in mind that the manager is the manager, is the leader of that market. And they are not, you know, they shouldn't, you know, just, just bend or break to any one particular, you know, in the moment of incident that happens. And so there really needs to be respect built in and what can help with that, you know, tremendously is just clear rules and, you know, fair and equitable enforcement of those rules. Um, we had um, a couple managers in this session last week who had just gone through um, like an instance at the market where uh, something happened and they were able to keep it from getting, you know, too personal by just being really clear. You know, we have these rules, we have to stand by the rules. Like we will, you know, consider this more, you know, post season if we wanna make any changes. But for now, this is how it is. This is how it is for everyone. You know, no one gets special or, you know, um, you know like picked on as far as that goes. So it just, it keeps that, it keeps that, um, that personal on side of it minimized. And just being, you know, communication really being valued is huge. If you have some kind of board, um, it's nice to have representation from the vendors um, on that to make sure you are, are kind of seeing all sides of it. 
manage money. I know with a lot of really small town markets, there aren't always fees or those fees are very small. And I'm not, you know, here to advocate really one way or the other, but I would say that do some math on this. Think about the benefits even of, of um, some type of structure. And it doesn't have to be one size fits all. If you want to have more crafts at your market, um, you know, within reason and within like a good timeline, you can make it less expensive for crafters to participate if you want. You can, you can have it so if you, you know, need a generator, it's a certain cost. If you sell produce, it's a certain cost. If you have this structure well planned and really transparent, um, that's a way to kind of think about managing your funds in that way. And then also vendors are going to want to know if they're paying to participate in this, how are you as the manager, you know, spending those funds. So having that plan, which can go back to your, you know, like your vendor recruitment, your spreadsheet there, your strategies of, well, we really think that paid ads will work. So where does the money come from to do that? And um, as well, knowing that the manager is able to, um, you know, receive, uh, you know, payment for, for all the great work that they're doing is huge too. I think that for a lot of things, if you, if you pay a little bit, you've got skin in the game, you are less likely to take things for granted. So do, do some math before opting out of fees. I'm not sure, you know, the situation for the folks in the room tonight. I do think that more markets than not have some type of fee, but um, something to keep in mind there. And then the promote piece was really talked about, you know, with Ben and Skyler in that, in that first session. I, I definitely just want to reiterate that we know that managers and vendors are all stretched thin and, and we don't, you know, want you to think that if you can't do all of the things, you know, we've, we've been talking about, um, you know, that's, that's fine. No one can. No one can do it all. No one can do it all the time. Uh, I liked Skylar's idea of what's the one thing you'll change, you know, yet this season, you know, and that can be more of a post season thing as far as the vendor recruitment goes, you know, um, and you can think about those different steps, you know, of kind of knowing what customers will buy, knowing how to reach them, what's stopping them, you know, from coming on board. So get everyone in the same room on the same page, make goals, delegate, and you can then have a much better chance of getting a good you know, group together. A couple other just thoughts on the promotion. Um, this was just a, a fun one. This picture is um, some center staff. This is um, in Macy at a holiday bazaar with some vendors who had attended trainings that we'd put together. So it was a nice you know, partnership that we were able to help some vendors um, get the resources they needed to vend. And then we were also able to go and, and take advantage as customers. And so that was just a nice um, partnership that can always be helpful when you're trying to really engage customers. Um, think about, you know, how to reach who you need. And again, keep in mind that, that we here on this call, we can be um, resource providers from you on that. Um, the other thing with trying to find partners is that sponsorship level of partnership. You know, what does it mean to be a partner? Sometimes it really is just someone who will advocate you word of mouth, you know, but maybe other times it's someone who can actually, um, you know, front the costs of certain things like signage. So you see this picture and this is Fallbrook. This is the market that's nearest to me. You see a couple different, you know, logos from businesses on that sign. And so even if you do work on your, you know, fee and fine structure, maybe get some grants, maybe get umbrella under another organization that's able to have, you know, a, a budget to, to help you out, there are always opportunities to, you know, seek more partners um, as well. And that's a whole nother group of people who might not have been, you know, in the know either, you know, their, their customers and their network. But the other thing with, this year in particular with the pandemic, the, the meeting customers needs by trying to work with current vendors, I really think is something that will help you from 
um, maybe aggravating that core group of vendors that you have, um, you do always want to bring in more diversity and, and you want to make sure you are making, you know, the option to vend available to a lot of people. But don't forget about those vendors who have been with you, who are loyal, who might be able to to also grow before you bring someone else in who might really be competing with them on a, on a certain on a certain item. So keep in mind the core group of vendors and then also the alternative marketing options that we have seen this year, um, you know, with a lot of online orders, curbside pickup, um, that type of thing. I, um, you know, I would not doubt that even after you know, health directives have been list lifted and things are, you know, safer post pandemic, I think a lot of those options will remain as really good ways to engage those customers. And so if you can get engaged customers, that will be that extra motivation for vendors, you know, to stick around because it's that it's that team effort and they can see that um, everyone's doing their best to keep to keep nimble to be innovative, um, regardless of of the times. So ways to nurture and grow, and then I think this will pretty much wrap it up, is really just, you know, staying in great contact with those vendors and see what they need. You can do survey vendors. Um, you, you can survey them. If it's a small group, just those, those weekly chats with them, you know, at the market. Um, the coalition piece comes in, and I've spoken with, I think, a couple of people um, on, on the call tonight about what can you do when there are multiple small towns in a pretty close vicinity to each other? You know, how can you nurture the market and grow together um, so the individual markets can have success and then the region, you know, and the state can have success and some of those successes can be, you know, replicated elsewhere. That could help by pooling funds together. It could help by, you um, um, pooling staff together. So you could maybe bump up, you know, several people who work just very part-time. Maybe you can create, you know, more of a half-time position for a person who can really have that, that cohesion of, of efforts and branding, you know, um, at the forefront. So use what you have. It doesn't matter how small your community is or how small your market is. You always have, have more, you know, than, than what's on the surface you might have vendors who are experts in certain things, you know, you might know someone, there might be a funder out there, you know, that, that has grants available. So just be creative. And, and um, I did want to just take a moment because I was able to get a ton of great info from a few different sources that I, I do want to make sure um, you can see when we uh, send out more in depth resources, but there, there's so much information, you know, on all of these topics that it could just be books, you know, are out there on this. So we wanted tonight to be able to break that down, give you some basics, some tips that have been more, you know, specified to rural Nebraska. Of course, there's so much more info out there. What qualities make the best market manager? What are options for paying the market manager? And do you have market manager job descriptions to share? Great questions. That's, those are great questions. As far as paying the market manager, um, there are different ways to go about this. So one is straight up just the vendor fees, depending on where you are. So like if you're in a, in a bigger area where you have a lot of vendors and you have really good customer turnout, sometimes the, the fees, the vendor fees are enough to pay a part-time manager um, a living wage. There are also another um, way that a lot of markets set this up would be to get nonprofit status and to apply specifically for funding um, from various sources that could um, that could that could offer salary as as part of what they fund. And then umbrella organizations, I would say, as the third that just comes like quickly to mind. So there might be already um, like a downtown association, a chamber of commerce. Um, a community foundation, perhaps. There are just already organizations out there that might be able to um, add a, add a part-time position there within their budget. As far as a job description, um, I don't think I would have something right away, but we would probably be able to find um, others around the state who would be more than happy um, to share what they do. Yeah, I think that's something we could 
definitely round up and share, and maybe even Jen tomorrow night, we could ask her and see if she could share one from, from her, um, her market as well. Yeah. yeah. The qualities is great. I remember two things that really like come to mind from the like questionnaires we did with managers in the spring. One person um, really, actually several people, they really just emphasize having some management training is, is, is huge. Some people are just that type of person anyway, who can be really direct and patient and um, confident, but there are also trains out there that if you have interest in that, uh, you might be able to get a little more experience. But if you have that from another you know, industry, that could be a really big benefit. And then I remember this word, someone used sociability, which mm. I love this word. I'm not sure if it is a word, but I love it. But it's that, that weekly maintenance of the relationship of not just showing up and setting up your market manager booth and you know, kind of doing the bare minimum, but really being you don't have to be super outgoing, but just being friendly, being available, that uh, people know that they can come to you, kind of having that trustworthy, um, friendly attitude is huge. Skylar and Ben, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think you're, I think you're right on it. I think, you know, someone who can be sociable and also detail oriented, there's a lot of a lot of conversation, you know, you're dealing with not only customers, but vendors. And if you're a nonprofit, you've got a board. So uh, you got to be really on top of it and, and keeping everything organized. Uh, and then some marketing skills don't hurt. Uh, any, right. any of those kind of things. So, but yeah, Skylar, what, what would you say from your experience? Yeah, I think, Aaron, what you said about the maybe a word sociability is, is really a good thing. I think like kind of, you know, that willingness to bring community into it you know not not um trying to hoard the the power of that role um, or the perception of that you know because that that perception can really like influence how vendors want to interact with you um but i think yeah just having that ambition is big too you know like there's obviously like that you know of course it'd be great if everyone was really social as the market manager. I think that ambition to keep the market going and be open to ideas is really valuable. Yeah, yeah thanks for those addition guys. I think that being firm within the season is huge, but then being open-minded to take feedback and make changes as appropriate is also huge. Well, thank you everyone for joining us.